So uh, welcome for tonight's second talk in our series about women's cancer. I have the great pleasure and honor today to introduce a uh, fabulous robotic surgeon, gynecologic oncologist, and also a very dear friend of mine, Dr. Ama Karam. Uh, Dr. Karam actually uh, grew up in Lebanon and uh, attended there the University of Beirut, where he received initially a Bachelor of Science with distinction, <coughs> uh, and then became a doctor of medicine. He did his uh, residency in OBGYN at the Johns Hopkins University, and then his fellowship in gynecologic oncology, partially actually together with me at the UCLA Cedar sinai program in uh, Los Angeles. And then after spending a year in my laboratory at UCLA researching novel treatments for ovarian cancer, he did something actually really unusual for a gynecologist. He went to uh, New York at Memorial Sloan Kettering, did a breast surgery fellowship. So he is really very unique among us gynecologic oncologists. And uh, we are very uh, happy to have him. Now, him and me, we were faculty at UCLA. and. Um, uh, four or five years together, and uh, when I came in April 2013 to Stanford, I immediately asked Dr. Karam to join me, and uh, I'm very grateful he did this. So he joined us in uh, September of 2013, and, and now is the Associate Director of the Division of Gynecologic Oncology. He is also the Director of our Robotic Surgery Program, which he will tell you more about today and uh, the director of our outreach program. Uh, we are here at Stanford Gynecologic Oncology with the help of uh, many, including Whitney Green, sitting up here in front, uh, really developing a very expensive service within the area uh, of uh, Palo Alto, San Jose, and further up north to provide our care uh, to patients. But uh, you will today actually uh, listen to Dr. Karam, who is and a uh, very well-known robotic surgeon has done some very advanced robotic surgery, things that other robotic surgeons cannot do. And uh, um, he's a well-known speaker, has lectured all around uh, the world, has uh, published uh, in uh, many prestigious journals, and is here tonight to tell you a little bit about his experiences and what robotic surgery really is. So uh, before he steps up to the podium, I want to thank uh, Whitney Green again and Nora Kane for setting up this second lecture series. There will be more in a three to four month interval, and uh, we will inform you, of course, about those. I've, I want to thank you all to, uh, come to, for coming tonight to make the time. I know everybody is very busy, um, and uh, we appreciate that you come and listen to us. This talk will be available online. You can watch it on YouTube. You can watch it also on the uh, website of the Stanford Women's Cancer Center. So you don't necessarily need to take notes tonight, but you can go home and then listen to this again at your leisure. So with that, again, it's my great honor and pleasure to introduce Dr. Karam. Thanks, Oliver, for, I guess I have it here, right? Thanks, Oliver, for that very nice introduction again. Thanks, Whitney, and everybody for organizing the, the talk. Um, and today I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the applications of robotic surgery. Uh, some people know it as da Vinci robotic surgery, at least in the realm of uh, gynecologic cancers. Uh, you know, uh, This robotic approach has been used in many different modalities, and um, gynecologic cancer is one of the main ones this, uh, this particular tool is helpful with. Um, I'm first going to talk a little bit about why we're here today, and then during the course of my talk today, we're going to be discussing the various gynecologic cancers uh, women can face and um, what their symptoms are, what uh, women have to deal with uh, when they're faced with gynecologic cancers and what some of the treatment modalities are, and obviously how uh, robotic surgery applies in the treatment of those patients with gynecologic cancer. Um, so just a little bit of an overview of the um, reproductive organs, whether it's the uterus um, or the surrounding organs. Um, and uh, somewhat of an illustration up here, maybe I can uh, 
point things out a little bit better here for you. Okay, good. So this is uh, the uterus itself right here uh, with the lining, which is called the endometrium and the myometrium. Um, so a variety of cancers can arise from the lining of the uterus or from the wall of the uterus itself. Um, then you have the fallopian tubes and the, uh, which are right here and the ovaries that contain the eggs. Uh, so while a woman is still actively cycling and having a regular menstrual cycle, this is where the, the follicles are going to form and the eggs are going to form. And then finally, the last area where you can see cancer or cancerous growth happening in the, uh, in the reproductive tract in women is the cervix, which is right down here, which is the opening to the outside where uh, you know, the blood will flow out when you're having a menstrual cycle or uh, the um, cervix will dilate to allow the baby, which usually typically grows inside the uterus to come out. And this is the last site that uh, you, we typically see gynecologic cancer arising from. Um, the vagina is underneath the cervix and it's typically the entrance to where we uh, do our variety of exams and to see where uh, um, any symptoms that, that women with uh, gynecologic cancers uh, have. And this is the main area we will examine at the time of uh, our, your annual exam uh, and your pap smears, et cetera. Um, so, each year, about 80,000 women will be diagnosed with gynecologic cancer in the U.S. Um, there are 100 different cancers that we know of. Uh, the main ones in women are lung, uh, breast, uh, colorectal cancer, or co cancer from the colon and the rectum. Um, cancer from the lining of the uterus is the fifth most common cancer in women. Um, the deadliest cancer in women as far as gynecologic cancers is ovarian cancers, um, accounts for the majority of women dying from can gynecologic cancer in the U.S. Uh, and if you group all gynecologic cancers together, about 80,000 cases will be diagnosed uh, every year. And those are mainly cervical cancer, uterine or endometrial cancer, um, and then ovarian cancer. Okay, so some of the symptoms women will encounter when they are faced with a gynecologic cancer diagnosis. Um, for women who are still cycling or still have their menstrual cycle will be irregular periods uh, or a bleeding in between the periods. For women who have gone through menopause, many women who are faced with gynecologic cancers will have uh, bleeding start again after they have gone through a period without any bleeding whatsoever. Um, thin watery discharge or pink discharge, discomfort in the pelvic area, any, dis any disruption or any change in their bowel or urinary habits are also some of the common complaints we see uh, in women with gynecologic cancers. So those women will come in with complaints that have to do with their gastrointestinal tract or whether they get constipated or have diarrhea or related to the bladder, whether it's feeling more urgency to go to the bathroom or going to the bathroom more often or feeling like they can't empty completely. So uh, before we uh, delve into uh, some of the details of it, I just want to ask a couple, some questions, some introductory questions about cervical cancer, which is the first cancer I will talk about. Um, do you, anybody have a, want to take a stab at how many patients every year in the U.S. are diagnosed with cervical cancer? I'll make, it, I'll make it easy for you, it's, it's C. It's uh, about 12,000 uh, patients every year are diagnosed with cervical cancer in the U.S. Thankfully, in many cases, the, this cancer is very curable um, and it does not account for as many cancer deaths every year. But it's the third most common uh, gynecologic cancer that's diagnosed in the U.S. Um, it most commonly occurs in women who are between the ages of 20 to 50. Typically, it's preceded by either a history of abnormal pap smears um, or uh, um, in frequently will present with abnormal bleeding uh, at, the time of, uh, the, at the time where it's diagnosed. Um, the uh, cervical cancer refers to uh, cancer from that lower part of the uterus that I mentioned to you. Um, again, um, it is typically seen in women between the ages of 20 to 50, typically over the age of 30. It is mostly a preventable cancer because it's driven by an infection by something called the HPV virus. 
uh, and since there's a period where it is in a precancerous state, you can catch it at that point and get rid of it at that point. So that's where pap smears and biopsies are important before it actually develops into cancer. But more importantly now, we have a vaccine that targets this virus that causes cervical cancer that we can um, treat patients with ahead of time so that they can fight off the infection from the get-go and never end up developing cervical cancer later on. Um, this is a slide that goes over a little bit of the paradigm as far as uh, how we diagnose what women complain of and how we treat patients with uh, cervical cancer. Um, some of the risk factors are, like I said, that HPV infection, smoking is a big driver of this disease. So obviously, if you see less smoking, that there's a lower risk of cervical cancer. Um, some of the more common symptoms you will see with this cancer are abnormal vaginal bleeding or heavier bleeding than typical. Uh, once the cancer spreads, it's associated with pelvic pain and sometimes pain with intercourse. Uh, most of the people that will diagnose this type of cancer are either your OBGYN during an annual exam or when you come in complaining of abnormal bleeding or a gynecologic oncologist if you've been seen by another physician who noted this mass. The tests that are commonly used to diagnose this, this condition are the pap smear test, which is common with the annual exam, a direct cervical exam, so looking at the cervix itself and taking biopsies of that area. Um, the treatment modalities to be offered for, that are offered for cervical cancer go along a uh, two or three mo uh, modalities. Mainly, if the cancer is early enough, then you can, in many cases, cut it out surgically, either through a large biopsy or a hysterectomy, which can be done either robotically, which I'll refer to a little bit later, or by a traditional hysterectomy. If the cancer is a little bit more advanced or spread, then radiation and chemotherapy uh, come into play. Um, the main surgical treatment for um, cervical cancer is what we call a radical hysterectomy. This has been the traditional surgical modality to treat the cervic uh, cervical cancer. It typically uh, involves removing the area of the cervix, which is, let's see if I can point to it again. Okay, so the area of the cervix where the cancer is, but also the surrounding area, which is called the parametria, and the portion of the upper vagina along with the uterus. Um, the reason you have to be able to take the area around the cervix more completely is to ensure that you've cut it out and so that you don't leave any trace of the cancer behind. Um, in many cases, especially in women who are young enough to still be able to bear children, are interested to bear, in bearing children, you can also try and preserve the upper part of the uterus and just remove the cervix itself along with the surrounding areas and preserve the ability to, for these women to carry children. And that's what we call a trachelectomy or a cone biopsy. Um, one of the areas that cancers, uh, some cancers like to spread uh, spread to our lymph nodes, um, particularly for cervical cancer, um, pelvic lymph nodes are in many cases involved. And so what we will do is remove those little green dots or green uh, little fava bean shaped uh, organs that are around the cervix that are called the pelvic lymph nodes. So in many cases when we do a radical hysterectomy, whether it's through uh, robotic surgery or traditional surgery, we will take biopsies from these lymph nodes or remove these lymph nodes along with the cervix and the area around it. Um, again, like I said, surgery is typically reserved for those patients where you can safely remove all of the cancer, whether it is a trachelectomy or a removal of the cervix alone or a hysterectomy. If the cancer's uh, spread or if it's gone beyond the cervix, we typically then have to use chemotherapy with radiation or to follow each other. And then surgery plays less of a role in that situation. Um, so the second cancer I'll be talking about today is uterine cancer. Um, and some of the signs of uterine cancer include uh, vaginal, uh, abnormal bleeding, uh, or especially if it's bleeding after menopause, um, pelvic pain, um, and uh, um, pain during intercourse. 
Um, so obviously the answer to this question, which is what are some of the symptoms that could come with uterine cancer, is all of the above. So anytime there's any complaint related to the pelvic area, that could be a sign of uterine cancer. The main symptom, though, that patients come in complaining of uh, is bleeding after going through menopause. Um, be, uh, and because most of these cancers are diagnosed in women who are 50 years or, or, or older. So it, 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 the most common complaint are women who have not had a period for a number of years and then suddenly they start having abnormal bleeding or spotting or discharge. Um, and that's where they frequently will come in to see their gynecologist and where um, they will be diagnosed with uterine cancer. So approximately 50,000 women every year will be diagnosed with uterine cancer. It is by far the more common um, gynecologic cancer we see um, and accounts for the bulk of those patients we diagnose every year with gynecologic cancer. Fortunately, it is also very eminently treatable cancer. And most cases of uterine cancer, whether it's cancer from the lining of the uterus or from the wall of the uterus, can be cured uh, mainly surgically um, and uh, less often uh, we have to uh, and it's not very often that we have to use chemotherapy or radiation in those cases in many cases surgery alone can actually get rid of all of the cancer um, like I said approximately 40,000 women every year 50,000 women every year are diagnosed with uh, uterine cancer it's usually either the fourth or the fifth most common cancer in women after say um, lung cancer, breast cancer, and colorectal cancer. Um, most of the time it comes from the lining of the uterus. It's the lining of the uterus where the, uh, this most, the most common form of uterine cancer comes in. Sometimes you have some rare cancers called sarcomas that come from the wall of the uterus, um, but those are by far a small minority of the patients that come in with uterine cancer. Uh, again, like I said, in most cases the uterine cancer is discovered when it's still confined to the uterus and where surgery is extremely effective at curing it and treating it. Um, this is again another table that sort of goes over the risk factors, symptoms, um, and some of the treatment modalities we can offer to patients with uterine cancer. As you can see, um, the older you are, the more likely you are to develop uterine cancer. So age over 50 is uh, risk factor for this, um, a history of being overweight or having high blood pressure or diabetes does put you at risk, a history of taking um, hormone therapy, especially if it's hormone therapy where you only take estrogen alone, um, can lead to uterine cancer, and the fact that uh, there are some women who have tried and not been able to get pregnant over many years and now have gone through menopause, those are patients that are more likely to get uterine cancer. The main symptom, like I said, is abnormal bleeding, typically bleeding after menopause. Um, most of the time, you will go in, uh, the patients will go in to see their OBGYN who will then perform a biopsy of the lining of the uterus when they see that the cervix is normal, that the other uh, uh, gynecologic organs are normal, and that's where you will be diagnosed. So typically, both on exam and on a biopsy, that's how you make the diagnosis. An ultras the ultrasound or pelvic ultrasound is typically a very useful test along with the biopsy because it can actually visualize the lining of the uterus, which you cannot see directly on exam. Um, it, the lining of the uterus is inside the body, inside the wall, of the, uh, inside the cavity of the uterus, and it's very difficult to examine on the table. So the ultrasound is typically useful to be able to see how thick that area is or if there are any abnormal masses there. Uh, treatment, like I said, is mostly surgical in these patients, uh, whether it's traditional laparotomy or now more recently um, robotic or that da Vinci hysterectomy I talked about, but a hysterectomy in many cases is curative in these situations. Rarely do we have to use radiation uh, or chemotherapy. It's, a, it's much more common in patients who have more aggressive cancers or cancers that have spread beyond the uterus. Um, so for surgical, for uterine cancer, we will um, in many cases do uh, a very specific type of surgery which involves removing the uterus, the fallopian tubes, and the ovaries as well as the cervix because, uh, let's see if I can pull it, yeah, 
This is where the cancer starts, and one of the more common areas for it to start spreading to are the fallopian tubes and by extension the ovaries, or to go down toward the cervix. So one of the main ways we will treat and stage this cancer is by removing the, uh, is by removing the uterus, the fallopian tubes, and the cervix, followed by the pelvic lymph nodes, which I had mentioned before. Those are one of the first areas that the, uh, the cancer will spread to, and then uh, what we call the periaortic lymph nodes, so lymph nodes that are a little bit above the uterus, um, where if the cancer in many cases is spread to the pelvic lymph nodes will be the next step as far as cancer spread is concerned. Um, it's unlikely that the cancer will spread directly to those periaortic lymph nodes, or in many cases um, you will see that um, you know, the doctors, when they offer surgery for this, will actually start out by checking the lymph nodes in the pelvis and then to go to the uh, higher up lymph nodes if there's any um, risk for the cancer to spread there. Okay. Um, so the third cancer I'll be talking about is ovarian cancer. And I'm going to start out with um, um, a true or false um, question. I is it true that um, Ovarian cancer accounts for about 3% of cancers diagnosed in, in women in the U.S. Um, and that's actually true. Um, it is the second most common gynecologic cancer, so it's not as common as, say, uterine cancer. The biggest difference here is that ovarian cancer is the deadliest gynecologic cancer. It's typically the one that we have the hardest time treating. Uh, mainly because by the time we discover the cancer, it's already in many cases spread beyond the ovaries and the fallopian tubes into other areas of the body. Um, so some of the risk factors here are obviously age is another risk factor, but family history is much more important in u ovarian cancer than any other gynecologic cancer. And having a strong family history of breast or ovarian cancer does put you at risk for that. Um, and uh, you'll hear a lot in the press, and you've heard about Angelina Jolie and her battle to talk about BRCA mutations. BRCA mutations are those genetic mutations or mutations in the DNA that increase your risk of developing ovarian cancer. And so that accounts for the bulk of those patients that we see that have an inherited form of cancer. Um, having um, a history of endometriosis or um, not being able to have children also puts you at risk for ovarian cancer. But again, I want to emphasize the importance of family history and age here as the main risk factors that drive uh, risk for ovar of developing ovarian cancer. Most of the symptoms that relate to or indicate ovarian cancer have to do with abdominal symptoms. Uh, bleeding can still happen, and it happens in many patients. But uh, the main complaint many patients come with to the uh, doctor are complaints related to their abdominal region, mainly abdominal pain, changes in their bowel habits, changes in their urinary habits. So patients will complain of this new onset of, comp of constipation. They start developing constipation after having you know, a lifelong history of normal bowel movements. Or suddenly they're having um, problems with their bladder and you know they need to go to the bladder more often and then um, as the cancer develops and spreads um, it uh, spreads to other areas in the in the abdomen and can result in a lot of fluid accumulating inside the abdomen so women will start having a lot of bloating and come in with a large abdomen full of fluid and that's one of the more common symptoms that patients present with um, so again, like I said, a lot of the time, the first people to examine patients with ovarian cancer are gynecologic oncologists, uh, OBGYNs, but also primary care providers will see patients who've come in with a variety of gastrointestinal complaints or urinary complaints and then uh, find out that it's actually an indication that the cancer is spread. Um, unlike cervical cancer or uterine cancer, a lot of the time you cannot perform a biopsy right away. And the way we diagnose ovarian cancer is typically when patients come in on imaging uh, and on exam, you can feel either a mass on the ovary or see a mass on the ovary on the ultrasound. And then many times we get CAT scans that indicate whether or not if there's a cancer, it has spread into other places in the body. Um, also for ovarian cancer, blood testing is important because there's a, um, a marker or a 
protein in the blood that allows us to, um, to um, if elevated, uh, that allowed us to, to sort of discover ovarian cancer. And in this situation, uh, if the, uh, there's a sort of a suspicious finding on ultrasound and the blood test indicates that there could be ovarian cancer, um, um, you get to the diagnosis that way. Um, the treatment for ovarian cancer is typically a combination of surgery, chemotherapy. Radiation is not so commonly used in uh, ovarian cancer. Um, the order in which you give the chemotherapy depends on the extent um, of the disease. So you may start out with surgery in many cases, followed by chemotherapy, or you may start out with chemotherapy first, followed by surgery. Um, the order, again, depends on how spread the cancer is. Uh, traditionally, this has always been a, a um, surgery that involves a large incision in the abdomen. But nowadays, when we discover this cancer um, and it looks very technically challenging to remove it all surgically, you can give chemotherapy first and then do a much smaller surgery in some cases and in many cases you can do a laparoscopic or robotic surgery to remove the cancer at that point um, and then end up with a much smaller surgery than if you started out with a big incision. Okay. Um, so again, this is sort of a nice segue to talk a little bit more about uh, what you guys are here for and um, talk a little bit more about robotic surgery for gynecologic cancer. So this is just a little bit of an introduction about the you know, various ways uh, we operate on women with gynecologic cancers. Traditionally, um, it's been through an approach where we make a large incision in the abdomen, whether it's an incision across the lower part of the abdomen, what people commonly refer to as a, a C-section type of incision or a bikini type of incision or a bikini cut or an incision where you go up and down on the abdomen, uh, mainly from the pubic area through the belly button. Um, those are the two most commonly, traditionally used types of incisions um, that we've used for patients with either cervical cancer, uterine cancer, or ovarian cancer. In many cases now, we're able to offer what's called minimally invasive surgery, meaning surgery without having to make a big incision in the abdomen. And that typically is either laparoscopic surgery, uh, robotic surgery, or vaginal surgery, where you either have one or several small incisions in the abdomen that are about a quarter of an inch across, uh, or no incisions, and then just an incision through the vagina to remove the uterus that way. Um, vaginal surgery is not so commonly used for um, for gynecologic cancer just because a lot of the time you have to biopsy other areas in the abdomen. So mainly when I talk about minimally invasive surgery for the treatment of gynecologic cancer, it has to do with either traditional laparoscopy or robotic surgery. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about minimally invasive surgery when, uh, uh, before I delve into robotic surgery. So minimally invasive surgery refers to both robotic and laparoscopic surgery. Uh, it started out, you know, about um, several decades ago where uh, people were able to access the abdominal cavity through smaller incisions than traditional surgery. The advantage of this approach is that you ended up with less blood loss at the time of surgery. So these were uh, relatively bloodless surgeries. Um, patients ended up with fewer complications. They stayed in the hospital for shorter periods of time. It resulted in less scarring, less infections. Um, it was certainly a lot less painful than having a big incision in the abdomen. And uh, for patients who were worried about the appearance of the abdomen, it was certain these inc smaller incisions were a lot easier to hide and to heal from. Um, so this is sort of the approach that we took with uh, traditional laparoscopy. We will make a small, what people commonly refer to as a keyhole incision. Um, we will introduce then a camera through there and some instruments, insufflate the abdomen with gas, typically carbon dioxide, which is not flammable, and that will allow us to then visualize the abdominal cavity and operate in that cavity. Um, the problem with, laparosco uh, with laparoscopy, at least, what prevented it from being able to be used for a, a whole variety of conditions are some, uh, are some of the um, 
drawbacks or some of the limitations of the actual technology itself. Um, most of the time when we operate with traditional laparoscopy, we view the inside of the abdomen through a screen, which is uh, it's a flat screen, so you only see two dimensions. You can't really gauge the depth all that well. And that's a very big limitation for patients, for pe or surgeons who operate in a 3D world. So that's been a big limitation. Um, the instruments themselves, because you have to miniaturize everything and uh, be able to fit them through small incisions, had to be rigid, relatively rigid, and were relatively hard to manipulate. So the dexterity, our fingers were a lot more dexterous than these sort of very limited primitive uh, metallic instruments were. Um, and it was, ver it's from a personal standpoint for a surgeon, a lot harder to move these things around than it is to operate with my hands. So those were the main limitations of traditional laparoscopy that prevented it from being used in, a, in the whole gamut or variety of cancers that we had to deal with. And that's where sort of, uh, um, that's where robotic surgery's been developed to be able to overcome some of these drawbacks. So the, uh, the robotic platform or this tool that we use to enhance laparoscopy or minimally invasive surgery, um, th the goals of this t platform are to improve your visualization. So instead of looking at things in a 2D, using a 2D screen, we're actually offered what's called the 3D uh, image. So basically, it's like going to one of those fancy movies now in 3D where you can actually see things and gauge the depth of things so that when you're reaching for things inside the abdomen, you're not trying to guess and it's a lot more intuitive and easy for you to be able to move around the variety of organs or look at the cancers. Um, the, the controls that, uh, that are offered on the platform are also a lot more flexible. They're a lot, they allow for, um, for the physicians to sort of recreate a situation where they can use the full capacity of our very dexterous fingers. So um, they, you replicate the movements of the hands and the wrists and the fingers a lot better that way. So instead of using very rigid, limited instruments, you're now able to move instruments in many different directions and be able to cut things out a lot more precisely and a lot more dexterously than you would if you had traditional laparoscopy. It also allowed the surgeon to be able to sit down and put himself in a much more comfortable position so that when you're operating on some of these longer procedures, especially when cancer is concerned and where you're operating around very delicate tissue, you can sit down and actually take your time and not feel fatigue at the end of the case um, by, uh, by doing the surgery. So it allows you a lot more um, you know, um, ease when you do that and you can actually take your time and really concentrate on doing a good job instead of trying to finish things more quickly before you, fatigue sets in. Um, so again, like I said, you're immersed in a 3D environment. It's typically a high definition image as opposed to a standard definition image. So you actually see details um, of what you're working with. I think in this situation, our, our um, uh, capabilities are also enhanced because the picture that we actually see is magnified as well. So and it's not like I'm seeing a small, I'm seeing things on the same scale. They're actually, everything is actually magnified. So it allows me to work around very delicate small structures a lot more easily. Um, and again, you know, even though the name applies a robot as something that's self-functional, it's not. The, um, the instruments are, are controlled by the surgeons at all time. They will only move if the, if the surgeon moves his instruments and will stop moving as soon as the surgeon takes his head out of the console or stops using the instruments themselves. Nothing is done autonomously. It's more like a master-slave um, situation where the surgeon is the master of the instruments themselves and the platform allows the instruments to follow the surgeon's commands. Um, and this is just a, a little example of how small these instruments are. This is, I think, a, a black diamond forceps. So it's one of the finer instruments that are available on the platform. You can compare that to the size of a penny or compare that to the size of an eraser. These are very small instruments. They just tell you about the scale that we're working, uh, on which we're working, and how delicate the work we can do uh, with this instrumentation, especially with the enhanced visualization. Um, again, 
Um, this slide just talks about some of the benefits of, um, lapar of traditional uh, robotic surgery versus open surgery. So uh, you'll notice one of the main differences here is on the right-hand side, you have um, the incisions that are used for traditional robotic surgery, say for gynecologic cancer. And on the left-hand side, you see what a traditional incision was for uh, a patient with uterine cancer. A lot of the time you have to make a big midline incision that goes almost all the way up to the umbilicus, if not higher. You replace that by five small incisions that are about a quarter inch across that are definitely a lot less painful than the traditional midline incision. Um, so again, um, you know, there are many indications, especially when you get more and more facile with the technology, that it results in a lot less blood loss. Uh, a lot less pain, especially from all of the, you know, instead of having a big incision where a lot of stitches inside, you have fewer incisions with just one or two stitches there. The hospital stay is definitely shorter. So instead of being in the hospital for three or four days, you're in the hospital overnight in many cases, be able to go home the next day. The recovery is also quicker from this type of surgery. And again, like I said, from a cosmetic standpoint, the incisions are a lot more pleasing and they disappear a lot more quickly than a big midline incision. What are some of the advantages of traditional, uh, of uh, robotic surgery versus traditional laparoscopy? They mainly have to do with the fact that you could do more with this type of platform. One of the biggest issues we had to face when we used traditional laparoscopy is you plan for doing the surgery laparoscopically and all of a sudden you're stuck. And all of a sudden it looks like you cannot do the surgery safely laparoscopically. In many of those cases, you had to basically go back to a traditional incision and make a big incision, which prolonged the surgery obviously adds to the complications, et cetera. With the robotic surgery, there's a lot less likelihood of us having to have to resort to converting to a traditional surgery when, when, we do, when we use this platform. And so that's what I think is the, one of the main benefits of this type of surgery is a, a lot less likelihood of having to do that. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more of some of the more interesting um, and sort of innovative things that you could apply with this platform, especially since you know, one of the main advantages is this enhanced vision that we have. We, you know, I, I can't see magnification 10 without putting like uh, loops on my, on my eyes. So it's definitely an advantage to be able to see all of this in magnified pictures. But also the definition of the image and the quality of the image allows for us to add on top of it. So it could actually enhance what we already have. So you can actually um, use this platform to also see in what we, it's almost like having night vision uh, where you can use near infrared to see um, things that you wouldn't see with the normal lighting. Uh, and one of, the, one of the technologies that was developed is it's called the fluorescence imaging. Um, fluorescence is basically anything that sort of glow in the dark almost. Um, so you um, have a, sp a specific dye and you can shoot a little bit of light on it and it gl suddenly glows in the dark. Um, you can do that when you're operating on people. So you can use this dye, um, shoot at it a special type of laser that it's not visible with the naked eye, and then visualize it using this um, night vision capability that the platform offers you. And all of a sudden, uh, structures that you couldn't necessarily see with the naked eye will start glowing with this green color um, and allow you to see actually more than what you could see with the naked eye. Um, that's particularly important, especially when it comes to look at in, looking at structures that are usually hidden from vision. And I talk, uh, and those are mainly in my uh, type of work, what we call lymph nodes. Lymph nodes are very hard to see with the naked eye, even when you magnify things to 10 times. Um, this is a platform that allows me to now visualize those lymph nodes so I can really target them when I'm doing my surgeries. The reason that's important is that in many cases, removing too many lymph nodes or lymph nodes that may not be necessary to remove, uh, you end up with unwanted complications without a lot of benefit from the patient's standpoint. Uh, many of you probably have seen women who've had, say, breast cancer and have swollen arms from having a lot of lymph nodes removed from their armpit. This is a technology that allows you to really target those lymph nodes that, where the cancer will spread to remove those without removing healthy lymph nodes 
um, and thereby sort of decreasing the risk of having swelling in the legs or swelling in the pelvic area that come with uh, removing unnecessary lymph nodes. Um, the next slide hopefully will show you a little bit. Can we dim the lights? Um, I'll show you a little bit of a video of, uh, this is actually one of my surgeries where you can uh, see the capability of using uh, this um, night vision um, to uh, visualize those lymph nodes. Oh, did it, did it work? Let's see. Ah, is it going to work? Okay. So I'm working now in what we call the pelvic sidewall. This is where the lymph nodes are, uh, and I'm trying to dissect uh, the lymph node, what we call the sentinel lymph nodes. You can see the green light already shining at the end of it. This structure that I was able to identify with this green light is the actual lymph node that I'm targeting. Um, and now that I could sort of flip back and forth between this night vision mode and the regular light mode, like um, um, I can target it a lot more and spare a lot of normal tissue around it. You'll see um, at the end of it when I flip to the night vision mode how it lights up green and you can really pick it out from the rest and be able to just remove that area and not remove the uh, unnecessary lymph nodes. So this is one of the, one of the technologies that the, this platform allows. I think it's also important to mention that people are trying to push the envelope with as, uh, as far as um, you know, how to really minimize the impact on the patient. And so far, the platform that I've, dis that I've discussed with you or the way we approach this and the way we do the surgery is through several small incisions. When I talk about laparoscopy or robotic surgery, I refer to three, four, five incisions that are small, but there's still three, four, or five. Um, I think one of the next steps um, that people are going to be pushing for is what we call trying to do all of this minimally invasive surgery through one small incision typically through the belly button, and that's single-site robotic surgery, which we've started to do here at Stanford. And basically, we are trying to replace those four or five incisions with just one incision through the belly button through which you can put in all of your instruments, sort of sneak them in that way, and be able to operate through just that one area without having to make a big incision and be able to do the necessary surgery to deal with the patient's problem. And this is what's called single-site robotic surgery. Um, again, like I said, the main advantage is that uh, you're getting one incision through the belly button. Um, it's virtually scarless since you're using a, 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 a typical scar that all of us have, which is the umbilicus. It probably saves some of the discomfort and uh, probably allows for a faster recovery. Right now, this type of approach I usually just reserve for patients who don't really have cancer but need to have surgery done, um, either patients who want to reduce their risk of cancer or patients who have complaints that are non-cancerous. Um, I'll give you, a, this is sort of a, an example of traditional, traditional incisions, laparoscopic incisions and single incisions. The bottom example is uh, one of my patients where, I, where we did a single incision robotic surgery and you can see the only incision she has um, is this incision at the belly button, um, and uh, this is basically a week out from surgery. Um, um, and so virtually scarless when she's completely healed. Um, so again, what I want you to take away from this uh, talk today is, you know, be an advocate for your own health. Um, if you have questions, you know, obviously ask them, take steps to approach your doctor and ask them, uh, about your, um, about your um, choices as far as treatment and about your diagnosis. And again, to ask again about what your options are, specifically when it comes to surgery. Okay. <laughs> so if you guys have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Go ahead organs through the incision point or through the vagina? So in many cases, because a hysterectomy involves removing the cervix, you have to detach it from the vagina. So you're, you're, you're left with sort of a natural incision at the top of the vagina that in many cases is big enough for us to remove all the organs through it. Um, I tell patients that 
in many cases, you know, um, God designed us to have uh, a pelvis big enough to allow for a baby to come through, and that's usually several pounds. It certainly a uterus, even when it contains a cancerous mass, can very easily come out that way. Um, if the surgery does not involve removing the cervix, a lot of the time um, you can remove all the ab abdominal organ, uh, the organs that you detach by putting them in a bag and removing them through the laparoscopic ports. It will, in many cases, involve breaking those structures down while they're in the bag and removing them that way. Um, but in many cases, since we uh, a hysterectomy for the treatment of uh, all these gynecologic can uh, a hysterectomy is usually necessary for the treatment of all these gynecologic cancers, we use that incision to take the organs out. For the lymph nodes to, to appear green like that, what do you inject exactly and when? So we take a, a green dye, uh, a basically a, a glow-in-the-dark dye, uh, and we inject it into where the area of the cancer is. So in cer this patient had uterine cancer, so we'll inject it into the cervix or the, uh, into the uterus itself. Uh, for cervical cancer, we'll inject that. Right now, we don't use this for ovarian cancer, but this is what we typically do for cervical cancer or uterine cancer, uh, at least in my practice. So you do it during the surgery and we do it uh, while the patient is asleep before we get started. You inject it, and literally minutes later, you can see this. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Sorry, somebody else had a question. So in case of ovarian cancer, you were looking for an elevated protein in blood. Which protein is that? Uh, we, it's called an antigen that's called uh, muxistine, and the antibody to it is called CA125. Um, it's cancer antigen 125, um, and that's the protein we look for in the blood. I was just curious, uh, what percentage of uh, surgeries do you do robotically versus still laparoscopic or open? Yeah, I mean, most of my surgeries are, thankfully, laparoscopic or uh, robotic. Um, in many, you know, robotic surgery is not necessary for every single uh, minimally invasive cases. There are some cases that you can do easily laparoscopically. Um, these are more for the complicated, more complex procedures. Um, I still do some uh, abdominal procedures. There are some cancers where you don't want to break things out in the, inside the body or they are too big to be able to remove to be removed safely laparoscopically, or the cancer is too spread for you to be able to do it uh, robotically or laparoscopically. And those are the situations where I have to make incisions. So I think maybe about 10, 15% of our, our, uh, our cases are that way these days. Are there any disadvantages to a robotic surgery? Uh, you know, obviously there's always disadvantages to it. I mean, it's not been around as long as um, say traditional surgery. So even though we think the outcomes are very similar to what we would expect from open surgery, we still don't have the proof that that actually is the case. Um, there are certain indications that when you start doing these cases, um, it takes a while to sort of get proficient at it and avoid some of the complications. But these are complications that you also see with traditional surgery. So obviously one of the important things that patients probably need to ask is, you know, how experienced their surgeon is and how many cases they've done because that, you know, plays into the risks of any procedure that, that they undergo, whether it's robotic or open. So, you know, I'm fortunate enough where now I have, you know, hundreds of these cases under my belt and I feel extremely comfortable with the platform. Um, and it allows me to do a lot more than I could traditionally do laparoscopically or even open. Oh, sorry. Have yeah. insurance companies accepted this as a, a, an alternative, or do they fight you on many Typically not. You know, it's reimbursed just like any laparoscopic surgery. There's no specific code for this right now. So the insurances will pay the hospital just like they would pay for traditional laparoscopy. Um, it will probably change, and um, I, I'm, you know, it, it's a sort of a moving target right now. But so far, no, there's not been a pushback when it comes to that. Sorry, in the back. When did robotic surgery start? Uh, you know, the the push for it started, you know, close to 20 years ago now, uh, and I think it started actually right here at Stanford, where. 
the engineers and the Department of Defense were trying to come up with um, a remote system to be able to operate on patients in the, in the field. So basically, you had a soldier that was injured somewhere overseas, and then the specialist surgeon may not be available right away. They wanted a platform that, to be able to help that surgeon operate on that patient remotely. Eventually, it sort of morphed into um, a platform where the surgeon is actually in the same room as the patient, uh, but it allows you to sort of overcome some of these dexterity issues. I think the, act, this, uh, the robotic platform we work with on right now, which is called the Da Vinci Robotic uh, Platform, started in the sort of um, early 2000s, late, late 1990s, when it started getting sort of a, um, a foothold in surgery. It started out mostly with prostate surgery, and then it branched out in gynecology and general surgery, et cetera. Sorry. How much is the price difference between this uh, traditional versus the robotic? Uh, there's obviously some of the, you know, anytime there's a new technology that's introduced, there's a price difference. Uh, and obviously, it sort of depends on how much of the equipment gets reused and how much uh, of the stuff that uh, doesn't get reused costs. And so there may be uh, an increase into um, the price of the actual surgery. Uh, but when, if you factor in um, the fact that some of the laparoscopic surgeries have to be converted to open surgeries, and that adds a lot of money, the recovery is longer, uh, patients get back to work a lot, uh, you know, it takes a, a lot longer for patients to get back to work and start to, you know, um, be able to gener you know, uh, get back to the usual activities, so that's a lot of, um, you know, lost earnings, et cetera. Um, you probably end up um, with the balance tipping toward like minimally invasive surgery and robotic surgery in that case. But from the actual surgery itself, looking at it in isolation, you probably use a little bit more technology and equipment. Um, but in the long run, when you talk about benefits to the patient, benefits to um, the actual entire population, it may end up resulting in some benefits that way because patients are able to get back to work, have fewer complications, um, um, and are able to sort of reintegrate, um, reintegrate you know, the working world a lot more quickly. Hello, this was really a great comprehensive overview and I hope you all benefited from this. But let me ask you one question that might be of interest for everybody. But uh, how does a patient know whether once she's diagnosed with gynecologic cancer, is a candidate for laparoscopic or robotic surgery? And if she is, how would she go by finding a physician that does these things? Right. I mean, there's a number of ways of doing that. There are, uh, um, you know, the, the, uh, the people who have the most common platform now, which is the Da Vinci Robotic Surgery platform, have a website where you can actually look up to see if there are surgeons in your area that does uh, robotic surgery. Uh, obviously, looking people up on the website of, say, Stanford, for example, you can actually look for people who actually do robotic surgery. I think the important thing is knowing that when you have a gynecologic cancer, going to a reputable um, institution, a place where you can see an actual gynecologic cancer specialist, a gynecologic oncologist, is one of the also very important first steps. And then maybe my last question here is, uh, where do you see the future of this technology going? It's not, it's, it's a pretty recent. Yeah, no, I think, I think it, it, it come, it, it's a really bright future for minimally invasive surgery because like I said, you can augment our faculties right now. So we can operate through smaller, into smaller areas, uh, do a lot more delicate surgery this way with fewer scars, and then the imaging can add a lot. So, you know, what I see with the naked eye, now you can see, you can add to that, and you can start imaging things um, and trying to preserve things where they would not necessarily have to be removed. So you can cut down on the number of complications or actually find out where the abnormal areas are a lot more precisely that way. So you're not trying to sort of figure out where the cancer is. You can actually see it directly and cut around it um, and remove it much more precisely. And I think that's where the next step is going to be better imaging, fewer incisions, um, faster recovery for patients.